Hello and welcome back to Business Matters at the Hindu with me, K. Bharat Kumar. On December 5th, 2022, the group of seven nations or the G7 and the European Union came up with an oil price cap, a price cap on Russian oil. The diktat was that if Russian oil was sold at more than $60 per barrel, then purchasers could not use ships or financial services coming from countries belonging to the G7 or the EU. Since December 5th, how have Russia's oil revenues changed? How has its fortunes changed in all this time? Let's take a look. With this price cap of $60 per barrel of oil from Russia, what did the West aim to achieve? It sought to bring punitive action on Russia for Russia having invaded Ukraine. And who's bringing about this action? The G7, a group of, it's an informal grouping of seven nations, Canada, Japan, Italy, Germany, France, the UK, US, along with the European Union. And how does this price cap come about as punitive action on Russia? Because the West aims to limit the revenues that Russia can make out of oil sales. At the same time, they don't want to shut off supply from Russia completely because that can send the oil market into a shock and oil prices could go shooting up. With already a global recession threatening you know, significant parts of the world, you don't want that happening. So the West aims to have some supply coming out of Russia, but not necessarily giving Russia a lot of revenue as it has been making these past few months. Has the West achieved its objective? Before we answer the question, here's a short preamble. Brent crude prices internationally have been trading in a tempered range of between $82 to $87 per barrel. This is a far cry from February 2022, when it shot up beyond $130 per barrel, almost near record highs. Russian Urals crude has been trading at a discount to Brent and it's about $55 per barrel. Since it's anyway below the $60 that the Western nations have imposed, the market has not seen too much of tumultuous action. A study by Finland's Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air, or CREA, showed in early January that Russia's oil revenues had indeed fallen and largely because of the price cap. If you look at the slide on your screens, sourced from the center, you will see its estimate of the decline in Russia's oil revenues. It shows Russia's expected earnings from fossil fuels in millions of euros per day in the September-November timeframe was 795. Since then, it has dropped thanks to drop in crude oil volumes to Europe, dropped in crude oil prices, end of pipeline oil exports to Germany. Russia's earnings now stand at 640 million euros per day. The G7 nations are meeting again in February, but it was supposed to review the oil price cap in that meeting, but they've decided to postpone the review itself by a month to March because they need more time to assess the consequences of the oil price cap decisions. But when they meet in February, there's still some action expected. The G7 is going to impose price caps on products that stem from crude oil. The first was a price cap on the crude oil itself. Now these are products. And there'll be two price caps on these products because there are some products that trade at a premium to Brent crude and others that trade at a discount. Examples of products that trade at a premium are diesel and kerosene and so on. Earlier this month, Reuters put out a report citing observers who said that it's not as easy to put a price cap on oil products as it was on the crude oil itself because one, there are so many oil products. And two, many of these are priced according to where they are sold rather than where they are sourced from, and hence the complications. When more sanctions that are expected when they finally arrive in February, Finland's Korea estimates a further drop in Russia's oil revenues to 543 million euros per day, as shown in the slide alongside. But some impact may get deferred to March because of the G7's decision that we just saw to review the oil price cap in that month. Interestingly, the center recommends that the price cap should be revised down from $60 now to $25 to $30 per barrel of crude oil and $5 per barrel higher for refined products. It says, this level substantially reduces Russian mineral tax revenue while keeping Russian oil production economically viable. If the price cap were lower to $30 from the $60 now, that would certainly push Russia's oil revenues further down. But the moot point is, will the West opt for the downgrade? It would be interesting to watch. Korea also says the Western coalition should introduce additional sanctions to limit Russian seaborne oil trade. This includes restrictions on sales of tankers to prevent Russia, its allies and related traders from acquiring old tankers to use to circumvent the cap, as well as prohibiting transshipment of Russian oil in territorial waters, 
and exclusive economic zones of price cap coalition countries. Restrict the use of tankers without adequate insurance coverage and ensure the enforcement of environmental norms for tankers in the Baltic and Black Seas. If there are indeed sanctions from Europe and the G7, for example, on ships traversing the Baltic Sea, how would it affect India's purchases of Russian oil? Nobody knows for sure because, you know, sanctions have to be signed into reality before we see the consequences. But here's an interesting tidbit. Russia and India have been working on another transport corridor, an entirely different transport corridor that would likely help them skirt these sanctions, if any. Here's how. In the middle of last year, there was a relatively quiet trial run of goods transport from Russia to India via the International North-South Transport Corridor or the INSTC. This route connects Russia, Iran and India, among several other countries who are signatory to the INSTC, through multiple modes of transport, sea, rail and road, totaling 7,200 kilometers, a distance that can be completed in about 25 days compared with the 40 plus days that it takes by the traditional route that we've been using across the Arabian Sea, the Red Sea, the Mediterranean, the Suez Canal, and around Western Europe into St. Petersburg via the Baltic Sea. However, things may not happen in a hurry. Shankar Shinde, chairman of the Federation of Freight Forwarders Associations in India, points out that containerized cargo movement seen on this corridor is mostly in the direction from India to Russia. He says that infrastructure for multimodal transport is still not complete. Rail connection between Rasht and Astara in northern Iran and between Chabahar to Zahedan in the south is needed and critical to the success of the corridor. Goods movement from Russia to India such as crude oil is typically bulk cargo and the route will see more such cargo once the rail lines are connected. Rail connectivity would make cargo handling more efficient. Why so? because there's always a cost and time to moving cargo between road vehicles and trains. About a fortnight ago, India's Ministry of Ports conducted a seminar on connecting the Chabahar port in Iran to the INSTC or the International North-South Transport Corridor. This indicates the importance that India seems to be giving to the development of this corridor. You may recall that India had significantly invested in the development of the Chabahar port in Iran in the past. The ministry has referred to the INST corridor as a multimodal transportation route linking the Indian Ocean and the Persian Gulf to the Caspian Sea via Iran and onward to Northern Europe via St. Petersburg and Russia. Now let's take a look at how India's oil imports from Russia have changed since the war in Ukraine began in February 2022. Early last week, Reuters reported that India's crude oil imports rose to a five-month high in December. Crude imports for the month were up 2.7% from November at 19.5 million tons. Russia continued to be the top oil supplier to India in December, shipping a record 1.25 million barrels per day of BPD. Compare this with imports of about 8.4 lakh BPD of Russian crude in May 2022, up from about 3.9 lakh BPD in April and 1.36 lakh BPD in May 2021, according to data from commodity analytics firm Kepler. From Russia's point of view, the report showed that 70% of Russian Ural's crude was headed to India at the time of writing. In its monthly report, the International Energy Agency said Russian oil exports fell by 200,000 barrels per day in December to 7.8 million BPD from the previous month, as crude shipments to the EU declined after the EU crude embargo and the G7 price cap came into effect. One may infer that the cost of oil is the primary reason why India continues to buy oil from Russia. When the government presented its budget last year to parliament, the assumption for policy makers was that oil would trade in the range of $70 to $75 per barrel through the fiscal year. You can see in the accompanying graph that the average Indian basket price has stayed well above that level of $75 per barrel, especially in the early part of this fiscal year. That's all we have for now. In the next episode, we plan to bring you some expert views on the government's budget presentation for the coming year. So stay tuned and meanwhile have a lovely week ahead.